Morning all. Right, uh, here we are again. If you're only following this on the YouTube channel, you'll be unaware of <laughs> this morning's very near disaster. Um, if you're following also on my Facebook page, uh, then you'll be fully aware of this morning's near disaster. What I decided to do last night, I've no idea why, um, <coughs> my computer uh, never gets turned off. It's, it's a bit like most things in this house. The telly's always on standby. It's, you know, it's why the electricity bill's so high. And uh, as it's been running for probably a year, the computer, I decided to give it a little holiday because it's been since I've been doing this, it's been struggling a little bit, and I think it's because of the, the volume of the video files and the editing suite. So I decided to turn it off. Nothing wrong with that, is it? Turned it off, went to bed. Came down this morning. Uh, so I checked my emails, went to turn the computer on, wouldn't start. Uh, it was making the most hideous noises. It sounded like a clapped out a washing machine, to be honest. Uh, fan kept starting, trying to start, and then... And then the machine had shut down, couldn't even get the screen on. Um, so I decided, in my ultimate wisdom, um, that I could fix it. Obviously, you can't, go, you can't just walk down PC world, can you? And I wanted to be filming today. So I put it on the kitchen table and got the screwdriver out and hoover. There's a lot of dust in there. Computers do suck in a lot of dust and I thought it could be something to do with the dust. So anyway, took the back off the computer, um, started undoing screws randomly, bits were falling off, everything was covered in crud, laying it all out on the table in order to put it back a little bit like I did with the old Datsun van. Um, yeah. It went fairly well, <laughs> sort of. I was faced with all these bits and pieces, cleaned everything down, got some wet wipes, cleaned off the, the fan, the tines of the fans, uh, hoovered out what I could, and then I blew in it, and this mass of dust come out, so I grabbed the little handheld Dyson and caught all of that. Uh, and then reverse order, put it all back together, which wasn't quite as easy as I thought it was going to be, to be honest. It's very, very fiddly. Uh, anyway, got it all back together, took it into the um, back into the office, plugged in all the miles of spaghetti into various holes, hit the on button, oh my god, the row. I mean, it, it proper did sound bad. Um, so left it running for a bit and did a bit on Facebook, which a lot of you will have seen, uh, basically help. Um, I had so many comments from you lot and most of them were completely useless, but completely in tune with the way I was thinking, as in slap it on the top of the palm of your hand, hit it with a hammer, shake it, kick it, buy a new one. Um, but a couple of guys on there, um, two people were simultaneously giving me advice that actually sounded like they knew what they were talking about. Um, so I picked one, followed his advice, um, and thanks to him, we're back, because it worked. I had this, this screen up that was telling me to do all this stuff, I didn't understand any of it. So, step by step, I followed what he said, hit yes, hit no, did this, pressed F1, pressed this, pressed escape, and bang, pads came back up, this is my screensaver, a picture of pads. Um, so we're back in order, back in work in order, uh, and today's filming's back on. So I've shot up here, I've set everything up, um, the missus is actually cooking some breakfast today, which is like, whew, major result. Um, so she's down there doing that, so I thought I'd come up here, make a little start, uh, pop down every breakfast, and then settle in for a day's filming. Right, that's better. Belly full of fry up. Bloody lovely it was. Scrambled egg, bacon, sausages, beans. Yum. Um, and a bit of a detour on the way back, we've got a bit of a chicken disaster. Um, whether you know or not, but I keep chickens. Uh, we've got six of them. Um, they live right directly below where I'm sat now in the garage. Uh, it's like an open-fronted garage and I've built my little perk and they've got um, like a little chicken house and stuff in there. And one of them has gone broody. Um, <coughs> so we've managed to get some fertilised eggs. Um, and she's sitting them at the moment. But she's sitting them in the box that the others lay in. So there's <coughs> a bit of a chicken war going on at the moment. Um, so we built her another separate nesting box which she don't want to go in, so that's where I've been down there. I'm covered in, well I'm surprised I'm not covered in chicken poo actually, I'm definitely covered in sawdust and stuff. But anyway, that's another matter entirely. So where were we? Pitfall. So this was, we'd done the winter, the first year, 
um, and we'd done half of a year, sort of started mid-summer the second year, uh, and we decided we were going to do this, you know, third and probably final year on Pit 4. We got the tickets. Uh, it would be the first time we'd fished it on the first day of the season. So we uh, we rocked up at you know the, the day before, like most people do, and there was a few of the Essex boys was already there. A uh, few turned up throughout the day, all picked our swims, all very gentlemanly. I don't think we had a draw or anything like that. I think we just decided who wanted to fish where, you know, and in the order you got there, away you went. Uh, I was round on the point. I was in the pad swim. I um, can't remember why, just, it was a good swim. Um, happy to get in there. But it changed a bit since the year before. Um, during the winter, there'd been some, I think there'd been a little bit of sort of semi flooding, there'd been some big winds as well. Um, and one huge great tree, um, one of the ones I used to climb on the right hand side of the swim had fallen in. Um, and this was now, I don't know, maybe 30 feet, 25, 30 feet out in the water with all the branches in the water and that. And uh, so a new snag in the lake. For me, that was like a big draw. I thought that's, a, that's an extra. The fish are bound to get under there. So anyway, throughout the day we set up. And I remember this, this was um, 1990, June. There was some important football match on. I know nothing about football. I'm mad for rugby. You know, I follow rugby. I watch all rugby that's ever televised. I'm, I'm, I'm totally into my rugby. Football, haven't got a clue. Not a clue. Um, but it was important enough that most of the lads wanted to watch it. Now the pad swim has got one of the better sort of areas behind it. As I've said before, a lot of the swims are quite intricate. Once you've got your bivvy up in there and your rods, there's not a lot of room. But the pad swim, you had the bit at the front for your rods, then you've got the, the path that I crawled through on the last episode. Um, and then at the back, someone's made like a big wicker fence and there's quite an area there. Um, you know, you could easily get four or five people sat around there. So someone had brought along um, a portable TV, you know, back in the days of black and white portable TVs. It, the screen was about yay big and it was probably about this deep, like tellies used to be with all the valves and stuff. Uh, with one of them stupid bendy aerials probably that you have to twist about to get the signal. Uh, so the lads all set up in my swim uh, <coughs> to watch this football match, whatever it might have been. Um, I've got a photo of them, uh, the telly on a bucket and a few of them there and a few more came and obviously some beer came, it was a lovely sunny day, which was June 15th. Um, so they sat and watched the football and I generally took the piss out from watching the football and got as annoying as I could with stupid comments uh, like you do, but it was in my swim so I could say what I liked. Uh, and we got royally drunk throughout the day and I don't know, I don't know who won because I don't know who was playing. Um, they all seemed quite happy about the result, whatever it might have been. Um, and then they all toddled off in the evening and we got our rods out sort of before dark so we could get them where we wanted. Now this tree was well handy because the pads were always just that little bit out of range um, for catapulting. And it boil it's no problem. Um, but we were on the, in fact we changed from the Tigers this year if I remember correctly. I think we'd gone on peanuts for some reason. Um, so I had a bucket of peanuts, um, couldn't reach them from the swim but I could go along the top of this sort of fallen tree, walk along the limb, or sort of the main part of the tree, like a tightrope. Um, it was a bit dodgy. It was, <laughs> you had to literally bat, and I got this big bucket of tigers and a catapult. You had to sort of tightrope your way across this, out, out of this tree. But if you got right to the end of it, um, I could actually reach the side of the pads, the catapult. So I've gone out there and, and baited up all around the pads. I think I had one rod each side of the pads. Um, and like I said before, I'm pretty sure it was a two rod wall, maybe three in the winter, but we were pretty, we were sort of using three most of the time. So my stroke rod, uh, my third rod, I decided I was going to fish under the branches of this tree. So I've gone back out there, um, sort of tried to look down as much as I could. It was a bit deep and murky under there and sprinkled some handful of peanuts. The last handful of peanuts I threw out, I slipped on the tree. How I managed not to go in, I will never know. I've actually gone round on the tree and I've grabbed the, the, the bit I was standing on. And my feet are still on it, but now they're underneath it. And I'm hanging under the tree, like inches above the water. The easiest thing probably would have been just to let go and fall in, but I was determined not to. And somehow I managed to get back on the top of the tree, get back to the bank. Um, and I was using the big ball heads on the two rods out by the pads, but because this was a margin rod, uh, I went back to like just a small, I think it was like a one ounce running lead, just a little light set up, single peanut, 
I flicked it out under arm, got it boof, straight under the branches, perfect, just where I'd sprinkled all these sort of broken and whole peanuts down in a little cluster. Um, and then that was it, that was it, job done really. Um, I can't remember who was next to me in the pads, but I'm, I'm uh, sorry, in the point swim, but I'm, I'm sure I wandered along and had a couple of drinks throughout the evening. And you know, you get that big excitement there the first day of the season, which we're going to get again this year, you know. Uh, when we eventually all get out there, it's going to be like June the 15th again, June the 16th again. I'll say 15th, 16th. I can never actually remember which is the first day and which is the day before. I think it's mid, used to be midnight on the 15th, I think. Um, but very exciting times. You know, you've waited three months to go fishing um, and then you're there, you know. You had the winter and the best bit you've missed all the spring. Um, come June, boom, you're there and everything's like bang on for it. So retired to me little sleeping bag under my brolly back of the swim uh, probably amongst a sea of empty beer cans that everyone had left behind that was usually the way and the next thing I remember was first thing the next morning first light so that time of year probably four-ish I was woken up by an absolute belting run leapt out of the bag ran down to the rods and it's the margin rod here's the one under the tree bushes um, and I looked into this fish and I sort of got him on, playing him underneath. The, it, obviously, he's trying to get right deep into the branches of the tree. But I bullied him and bullied him uh, and managed to get him away from the tree and you know, got him into the open, deeper water in front. He's chugging up and down. It's all pre going pretty well now. It's all pretty safe. Um, <coughs> he's come up, done the old pinwheels, smaller and smaller, and eventually he's hit the surface. And he's gone into the net. I've taken one look in the net and I can see it straight away. Um, it's Rob's fish, you know, it's the one I want. Um, and there he is in the net, first bite of, of a new season, you know, first fish on the bank, I think. I don't think anyone else had caught by then, not sure. Uh, and there it is, it's in my net. I've, <laughs> I've got my target fish straight away, first bite. I was absolutely over the moon with it. It's a beautiful fish. Um, it, was, it wasn't 30, it was 29 something some ounces that don't really matter it doesn't really matter what it weighed it you know when you set your sights on a fish uh, a particular creature if you like an animal and you catch it that you know you take a note of the weight um but it don't really make a lot of difference does it you know you've wanted to catch lumpy bumpy umpy stumpy whatever rob's fish this fish single scale and you catch that fish so it's it's job done and it's a target achieved um got keith round to do the photos um, and we celebrated um, for a little while, but not for long. Um, in fact, it was early, so we probably only had two. We might have had breakfast, actually, I think, at that time of the morning. Um, but within, I remember, it wasn't very long. It was only by, oh, about lunchtime. So bear in mind, this is still the first day of the season. I'm in a swim. I've had my target fish. There's fish out there by the pads. I'm in a swim that a lot of people would have liked to have been in. Um, and a wind sprung up, and it must have been a southwesterly. Um, and it was blowing from behind me. I mean, a lot of trees behind me, so I wasn't getting any of it. But it was it was coming down the lake off the end of the point, curling round as a southwesterly does on pitfall, and pumping down into the swim right in the corner, which is called the southwesterly. That was obviously taken. Uh, the southwesterly is, is almost like on a little point. It's in the corner against the, the, the bottom bank, which has got no swims on, but it sticks out a little bit. And as such, it creates a small bay on its right hand side before you run along the Oaks Bank. So basically, you've got the Oaks swim, um, and then there's one other swim in the bottom of this tiny, not so bay, it's just a bend. That's exactly what it is. It's the inside of a bend. And the waves was pumping in there you know they were getting stronger and stronger and I sat there looking I'm thinking it looked bloody good over there it really does and then one just slid out just just sort of head and shoulders come out halfway across to there and I thought they're definitely they're coming out of the pads they're following that wind and then I see another one proper crashed out getting closer so I've grabbed my rods um, I think I just got rods mat low chair you know just what you need to fish with alarms and me and Pads have charged around there as quick as we can. Got into the swim and I've looked out and as I've looked out another one's come out quite close in now. I thought this is absolutely nailed on, you know. These fish have been left alone for three months or more. Um, 
they want to feed. It's a brand new wind. It's first day of the season. It, you know, it's almost unfair to cast out. Uh, but I did cast out, obviously. Um, flick two rods out there, right where the, the closer fish had shown. Put them down on the deck. Can't even remember if I put the alarms in or not. I had a chance to put the alarms in. Uh, but I'd only been fishing for minutes. One of them's rattled off. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So I played this fish in, and I say the, the wind's coming in. One of those fresh sort of summer southwesterlies, you know, beautiful wind to be in. This wind's coming in, it's gorgeous, and I'm playing this fish up and down. I'd, I'd never even fished this swim. I think it was called the executive. Um, I've no idea why. It wasn't very executive. It was only a tiny swim in the corner. It was quite nice, but anyway, so I'm in there playing this fish in. It's come up, and as soon as he hit the surface, I thought, that's another good one. You know, bear in mind before, you know, we'd, we'd low 20s, a mid 20 was a good fish. This come up, it's obviously an upper 20. Gone in the net, done the do, weighed him in. I think it, that one was 27 pounds. Um, so I'd had a 29 and a 27 on the first day of the season, back when a 29 and a 27 were big fish um, from a lake that I knew there were better fish in, and I'd always been sort of trying to get these bigger, bigger specimens. So it was a hell of a start to the season. And I'll never forget when I did the photos of that. I got him on the mat. Someone came along to take the photos. Can't remember who. Um, uh, and as I was sorting the fish out, I kept looking around and I kept saying, I could smell shit. You know, I really could smell, like, dog poo or whatever. I couldn't see any, but it really, you know, I even thought it might be the fish for a minute. They had a strange odour or the mat. I lift up the mat and had a look and I couldn't see any anywhere. Um, anyway, I photographed this fish in the wind. Um, done all the photos and that and put it back. I could still smell this poo. Uh, and it wasn't until I got, I know it was later on that day actually, I noticed I had um, a, just a brown mark on my knee, a little brown mark on my trousers, and then over and sniffed it. I thought, oh, that's what it is, you know, that, that, that's, that's where the smell came from. But this was back in the days of normal camera film, you had to take it in to get developed. And when I got the picture developed, I realised why I could smell poo so badly. I had a dog turd or a turd of some description stuck to my knee. But of course, I'm holding the fish and it's below the fish, so I can't see it. It obviously dropped off before I noticed the little brown stain, but I actually had a tur flattened turd attached to one of my knees as I was taking the photos. Obviously, that's why I could smell poo. I was covered in the bloody stuff. Um, but no, that, that summer on there, that, that last, our last summer on there, it was glorious because it was such a beautiful pit at that time of year. It was lovely. Um, the fish used the pads a lot. They used the southwesterly swim a lot. Mark, Mark Wilcox was mad for that swim. He absolutely loved that swim. It was hard to get in it if, if, you know, if he was about, he'd be in there a lot of the time. Um, I'm not sure I'd actually managed to have a go in there until, until this year. I remember a couple of weeks after um, the start of the season, I managed to get in there. Uh, it, was, it was a lovely swim to fish. It was in the corner. Your left hand bank was, was no fishing, so you had your own bit of real estate. But the problem with the southwesterly is it had pylons. There was a swim on the canal bank called the pylons, and there was a pylon behind the southwesterly, and the cables ran across. And as such, they were very low, very low. To cast from the southwesterly, you had to cast between the cables. So your cast had to be sort of low and very true. Or if it was going high, if you wanted to get a bit further, you had to go up between the cables and make sure the lead came back down between the same pair of cables. Otherwise, obviously, you're over a cable and your rig would end up tangled up in the electricity pile on above you. Um, so it was a tricky old swim to fish. Uh, casting out at night was a bit of a disaster, to be honest. Um, but it was a very productive swim, had some lovely bars out there and the fish really liked it. They also liked it under the no fishing bank. There was a big bush there that used to hang over and you used to get a few bites under there. So that, that was a good area um, and one that I got into on the odd occasion when Mark weren't about. The strangest thing was though, although I'd started to get a few better fish, um, like the previous autumn, I'd had those nice sort of mid upper 20s. Um, and I'd started off this season in blinding style with a, like I say, a 29 and a 27. Um, and there was a few more over the next couple of weeks. Of those sort of mid-20 size of fish. Keith, somehow, I mean, he was still catching fish, but I don't know how he managed it. He actually never had a 20-pounder from Pitfall. 
I'd say. He caught fish, he caught, you know, his fair share of fish. They were always seven, between 17 and sort of, I think, 19 and a half, 19 and three quarters, maybe even, was the best he ever managed. And the bizarre thing was, he took two guests there, as far as I know, only ever two guests. <coughs> the first one was a mate of his, a lovely bloke called Dave Porky, his nickname is. Uh, he took Porky up there once for one guest session and they fished, I think Keith fished on the point and Porky fished right behind him on the back point. Um, that was a perfect social area, the swims were almost back to back. Um, and Porky had one bite, one fish, 22 and a half pound. Uh, uh, Keith was just like, I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Um, and the second guest he took up was his son, Vince. Um, now I've met Vince since he was, you know, proper little. Um, and he he's a very good angler. He really is a very good angler. But he was only young at this stage. But, he, you know, he was still very capable then. And it must have been the school holidays, uh, the 1990 summer holidays. Because uh, he took him, I remember he took him a couple of times. Uh, but anyway, first time he's taken him, him up there. I can't remember where he fished out. That might have been over the point, so I had somewhere. Um, probably was, because obviously Keith was, it was Keith's guest and his son, so he was looking after him probably cooking for him and untangling his rods and what have you. Um, and Vince had one bite and he had Rob's fish at 28 and three quarter pounds, I think it was. <laughs> so Keith's own son actually done him, uh, his mate done him. And uh, yeah, I have no idea how come Keith never caught a 20. Um, but that was, that was quite a thing when, when Vince had this fish, obviously his biggest fish by a long way. I've um, got some photos of him as a skinny little lad struggling to pick up this bloody great big mirror carp. Um, yeah, it was a laugh. But then also, it, it actually it was the school holidays, I remember, because the next week um, after Vince had that fish, Vince obviously was now wanting to come every week, and he'd come back to the lake. I wasn't there. <coughs> he came down with Keith, uh, and Keith had got tickets for the pair of them to go and see... Somebody not insignificant, something like the Stones or something. I don't know. It was a it was a concert at Wembley or somewhere not too far away um, of a major band. Anyway, I can't remember which band. Um, and he brought Vince down, and Vince decided, although he had a ticket, he was so into the fishing now that he didn't want to go. Uh, so Keith went on his own and left Vince at the lake with somebody else keeping an eye on him. That's only for the afternoon, evening. Um, but at this time. Um, I remember it quite well because I'd gone to Berlin. Um, I'd gone to Berlin to see Roger Waters in concert. Um, I don't know whether how many of you remember, but 1990 was the year that they started to dismantle the Berlin Wall. And Roger Waters put a gig on in the no man's land because, um, again, I don't know what your geography is like, um, but. Berlin, you get East and West Berlin. Now a lot of people think that West Berlin is part of West Germany and that's the border with East Germany, but that's not the case at all. Um, I've got quite an affinity with Berlin. Um, I've been there a few times, um, so I know the layout. And what, what Berlin really is, is an island within East Germany. Um, and West Berlin is a, a small section of the West, completely, surround, completely surrounded by a wall within East Germany, or was, until they tore the wall down. And then Roger Waters done this amazing concert, obviously, the wall from Pink Floyd, um, in the no man's land. There was a quarter of a million people there, 250,000 people within, you know, with tickets. And then there was the whole of Berlin all hanging out the top blocks of flats and everywhere. It was just a sea of people. It was the most amazing concert I've ever been to. At one stage, Roger Waters was actually in a helicopter over the crowd singing out this helicopter. They had the puppets that Floyd used for the wall. Um, they were worked by tower cranes. They were enormous. It, it, it was an extravaganza. We had all these guest artists singing and, and it was unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. But like I, I said, I'll, probably, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you the story. Um, nothing to do with fishing, but we've got time, haven't we? My affinity with Berlin started way back, way back. I used to work, um, sort of work, I used to do odd jobs and work a bit, sort of part-time, um, in a motorbike, 
not a shop, like a workshop, I suppose. And they did, they used to make all the big Harley choppers, you know, the low riders with the handlebars up here and the extended overstock forks and the hard tails. And as such, a lot of my mates at the time were bikers. You know, they all had these big Harleys. I, I didn't have one myself, couldn't afford one, never had the, the money to do that sort of thing. Um, but I used to work on them as as much as rub down the tanks for the spray jobs and what have you. Uh, and I used to go with this crew to lots of motorbike shows, um, like the Kent Custom Bike Show, for example. That was one that I, I'd done. And I used to go, like I do at the fishing shows, I used to go to work on a stand. Uh, and I remember one year, our company vehicle was a hearse. Um, and we'd, we rocked up at the Kent Custom Bike Show, you know, we'd got a stand booked and we pulled in in the hearse, all outdoors, pulled in in the hearse, popped the back of the hearse up, set up like a, a wooden bench table and pulled out all these um, you know, chrome tanks and bits and bits of bike stuff, you know. Um, and that's what we were selling off the front. We had a big barbecue and the, the, the back of the hearse, or the bit nearest the seats, was full of, uh, next to us where we lived, was the King and Barnes Brewery. And it was just full of crates of festive ale. So we just spent all day barbecuing, drinking this festive ale uh, and selling stuff to all these sort of Hells Angel type people. Uh, they put on loads of bands at night and uh, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a good time of my life. I enjoyed all of that. Um, but one day, a little while later, I was down in Brighton, and this was the days of the sort of the boulder hat and what have you. Uh, and it was about 11 o'clock at night, I suppose, and I was in the sea swimming, just my shorts and my boulder hat. And I came out of the sea, all my mates were sort of sat on the beach, and there was these two great big, you know, chopper Harley Davidson things parked there. Um, and the two guys in all the biker gear were just sat on the wall having a beer. And I see the bikes, and I, like I say, I, I had an interest. So I went over there and started chatting to them, and they were German. The two guys had come from Berlin, um, and they were just doing a, you know, a tour of Europe. And I got chatting to them, and at the time I lived in a pub. Um, I was sort of from six months old till 18, I suppose. I lived on and off in pubs. My parents had pubs, my grandparents had pubs. Explains a lot, doesn't it, really, when you get the whole story. Um, used to come home from school, aged 14, I suppose, come in, take my school uniform off, put my clothes on, go downstairs. I used to open the pub at 6 o'clock and work from 6 till 7 every night um, until the bar staff came in. But anyway, I digress. Uh, this time when I bumped into these two German guys with their bikes, um, I was actually looking after the pub while my mum and stepdad were away somewhere on holiday for two weeks. Um, there was staff as well, so the staff had run the pub and I was just in charge of staying there and making sure everything was locked and the alarms were on and what have you. <coughs> so I said to these two guys, if you're touring around and you've got nowhere to stay, um, come visit me in my pub. Um, and I'd written down the address for them and gave it to them. Thought nothing of it. I mean, this is like I say, you know, it's midnight by now. I had quite a few drinks, they had as well, whatever. Thought nothing of it. Uh, about two days later, I'm upstairs in the pub first thing in the morning, before it, well, way before it opens, and I can hear this <laughs> outside, the, the piston noise of a Harley, it can only be a Harley Davidson, two of them, right outside the window. And I thought, oh, what's going on here? So I poked my head out the window, and it's this, these, these two German guys, um, and they've, they've taken me at my word, they've turned up, I moved them in upstairs um, in the pub, which my mum still doesn't know about. Uh, and we had a whale of a time. I took them out, showed them all the sites we parted on and what have you. Uh, and November that year, so a few months later on, they sent me an invite to a party at their house in Berlin. So I packed myself a little rucksack, jumped on the train, went off to Berlin. Um, I stayed a month. I don't know why, I loved it. I got there, we had the party. Uh, I was sleeping on the floor in my mate's front room of his flat. Uh, and his Harley was actually, because it was winter then, he, he used to take the Harley upstairs into the flat, take it up in the lift and everything, and it was in, it was a corner piece of the room uh, with a pot plant and a spotlight on it, and I was sleeping on a like, lilo thing uh, next to this Harley in his front room. Yeah, and I ended up stay, staying there a month. In fact, there was a stage of my life uh, where I was seriously considering moving to Berlin. I got on so well with all the people there, it was my sort of way of life. Um, I loved it, absolutely loved it there. And I went back a few times. Um, I hitchhiked back out to Berlin. 
um, which is a bit of an ordeal because you have to actually hitchhike through East Germany to get there, which is obviously a, or was a communist state and you, you couldn't just have free passage. I think you had to get a pass to get in and out. Um, but I used to hitchhike everywhere back in those days. I used to hitchhike to Brighton, Crawley, back, backwards and forwards just to go out on the piss for the night. Hitchhiking was just the, what, the way I travelled. Um, so yeah, Berlin became um, sort of, you know, very close to me, if you like. Uh, I stayed in good contact with my mates out there. I used to go out there regularly. And when they announced the wall was coming down, Roger Waters was going to do this amazing concert up against the, you know, in the no man's between the walls. <coughs> we just had to go out there. Um, I went with my mate Clive, who I shared house with at the time. Um, yeah, it was it was an absolutely amazing thing. The, the wall in Berlin is um, or was. Uh, you know, you imagine this big grey wall with barbed wire on the top and machine gun turrets and, and minefield the other side. And that's basically sort of what it is. That is the reality. They had dogs and all sorts. But that would be if you were looking from the East German side across to West Berlin. From the West Berlin side, they decorated the entire wall with graffiti. Really good graffiti. In fact, I brought a photo up. Where is it here? Um, I'll, I'll pop this up on close up, but this is a photo of me back in the day up against the Berlin Wall, looking very dapper there in me. Um, oh, I've got me a uh, shop t shirt from the motorbike place, uh, custom corner it was called, uh, double denim, none other then, white pumps, and a very, very gaily coloured um, wall behind me. I remember I actually um, borrowed a uh, push bike and push bikes right round the interior of the Berlin Wall, um, visited the, is it, is it the Brandenburg Gate, whatever, some places of historic interest, probably visited more bars than I did places of historic interest, um, but yeah, no, it is a mad place, uh, and fully enjoyed, the concert was crazy, um, and then jumped on a train about a week later, and uh, made my way back to England, Swapped my double denim for a bit of fishing gear and uh, made my way back down to pit four. Carry on where I left off. So, back down to pit four. Um, obviously still middle of summer, still lovely, enjoying it all. Um, <coughs> and catching a few along the way. Uh, no major ones of note, but I did come very close to something of huge note um, on the day that I actually met Grey Scar. Up until now, uh, this fish, grey scar, has been very much in the mythical, cat, you know, sort of category. Um, Mark had told me he'd seen it. Uh, he told us that originally when we first sort of rejoined, when we met him in the pub that day. Uh, a couple of other people had glimpsed it. I'd never seen it. And I'm one of these people, I don't disbelieve anybody. You know, I take everything on board. Um, but you have to see things with your own eyes, especially when it's the mythical monster. Now, I've shown you and described to you sort of the layout of Pit 4. You've got the main section of the lake, the point around the back, and then <coughs> it all tapers away up into where it sort of is blocked off from the River Fraze, where the fish managed to escape in the flood. And that ends like a very small river section, uh, very, very narrow. Um, and to get to one of my favourite swims, the Builders, you had to walk all the way along the canal bank um, and go... I think it was a little bridge at the end. You went over the little bridge um, at the very, very narrow bit and then back down the other side to get to the builders. And I was doing this one day. I was walking up this, this back bank over on the sort of woods side, uh, just sort of looking down into the, the river section, if you like, um, and I saw a carp just under the surface, just the shape of a fish, just sort of, went in swimming about, really, just milling about right close in there. And it was quite well grown on the banks there. They'd, like little stands of reeds and bushes and stuff so I was quite sort of separated from the water. The fish couldn't see me. I could see the fish, the fish couldn't see me. So I got down on my hands and knees and crept up to the edge and just sort of parted the reeds a little bit like a little curtain. And I looked in there watching this fish and I looked down closer and I sort of sensed a movement there and there was this carp um, and it was massive like compared to the other fish in there. Good mid-30, you know, good mid-30 right below me and it had an unmistakable mark 
uh, like grey mark, and I thought that that's grey scar. You know, that's the fish they're all talking about. How I'd never seen it before, I do not know, because I spent most of my life up trees and still do. And you get such a good view into the water, I'd seen most of the fish in there. I thought I'd seen all of the fish in there. But here he was, here was grey scar, right in front of me. Um, hadn't clocked me at all, quite happily, just sort of just under the surface. And occasionally looking up, just tilting up, you know, just back, just just sort of making, not bow way, but just like a little crease in the surface of the water. I thought, he looks bang up for a floater, absolutely bang up for it. So I can't remember what swim I was in at the time, but I run back to wherever it is and came back armed with a rod um, set up for floater fishing, little controller float, um, light up link, you know. Um, I can't remember whether I actually had dog biscuits. I think I did actually, I think I had some dog biscuits, some chum mixers, and if I didn't, I'd nick them off a of fat Sam. But I managed to get back round there, um, flick a few baits out and let them sort of just work their way along this, this sort of rivery section until they got over the top of the fish. Sure enough, he's come up and, he, and he's interested. I think he might have actually slurped on a couple of them. So I've got back out you know, from the reeds, got the, the rod all set up, and I thought, I can't just go up there and like plonk it on top of him and be gone. This is going to be my one and only chance. It's the first time I've ever seen the fish. I'm not going to get another shout at it. So I've just fed the rod through, like sort of fishing blind, through a gap between the bushes with a controller bang up against the top eye, open the bail arm and just sort of slowly let, let some line out so it's gone down, moves the rod, a little bit of slack line, got it all settled perfectly. Set back as far as I could. Through the branches I could just sort of see stuff happening. I could just see bits of water and bits of back and what have you. Uh, and then there's a bloody great slurp and a swirl and I've just lifted, I knew, I've lifted the rod up and the rod zooped over and I thought, I mean, this is it, you know, I have hooked him, I've got the myth on the end here and I've leapt up and I've bent into this fish. Which, the rod didn't bend quite as much as I was expecting it to, to be honest. I was expecting him to go ballistic and just go powering off into the main lake. But no, there was a bit of splashing and a bit of plopping about and I've grabbed the net put the net in front, slid him straight over the cord, looked in the net and I've got a 13 pound mirror. It's the smallest carp, in the, well, it's the smallest mirror carp in the lake. There was no sign of this grey scar fish. I have no idea what happened. I don't know at what stage this mythical monster moved off and the 13 moved in or how he transformed himself into, from one into the other. I've no idea. It was the perfect opportunity. Everything went according to plan. It wasn't like there was a load of fish there, you know. In fact, if I remember correctly, at the time I put the bait in, there was only the grey scar there. Um, and this one fish further behind, which I wasn't sure what it was, which had drifted off by then. Probably a 13 pound mirror. He probably drifted off, come round in a big circle, seen the floater and just gone bang, I'll have that. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, that was the one and only time I saw the mythical grey scar. Uh, and I was convinced I'd hooked him. But Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. There was one more very memorable uh, occasion at Pit 4 um, that summer. It must have been, I think there's a bank holiday, isn't there, right at the end of August? I think the 31st of August is the summer, late summer bank holiday or something. Um, and the event was memorable for sort of all the wrong reasons. Very similar to some of the other reasons you've heard previously, to be honest. Alcohol related. I'm not painting myself in a very good light in this series of blogs, am I really? Or am I? I don't know. Anyway, I told you I was born and bred in pubs, so, you know, that's just the way it is. Sorry, you have to put up with it. Um, yeah, on that last uh, August bank holiday, the horse and barge had a, a day, um, you know, bunting and banners and barbecue. Um, it, most of it was held in the garden, they had music out there. Um, <coughs> on the, I don't know whether it was the Saturday or the Sunday or the Monday, I don't know, but over the bank holiday, uh, they had this sort of open day, um, <coughs> and of course we were just right next door, so we decided to pop along for a visit about, oh, I don't know, lunchtime, early afternoon, I suppose, something like that. Um, I remember the valley was was sort of alive that day, there was a lot going on, you could hear music from all over the place. Um, the canal that, that ran along the side of Pit 4, um, there was a procession of barges, like these party barges, um, where 30 drunken people all get on this great big barge that 
blares music out and just goes up and down the canal really slowly as they get more and more drunk. Uh, so these party barges have been going past and they can moor, the, the pub is on the canal, the horse and barge, uh, and they can moor up right next to the pub and go straight into the garden. So we could hear all this raucous going on and, and we're sat at the lake and thinking we're proper missing out here. And I remember um, I was down there with my uh, girlfriend of the time, she'd come down uh, for that weekend. Uh, she was a Scottish girl, um, liked to drink, uh, Glaswegian, so say no more. Um, and me, her, I think there was Keith, a um, few of the lads. I, I can't remember the, the entourage, if you, if you like, but uh, we all went up the awesome barge um, into the garden. Um, and it was great. It was really, really busy. I'd say they had the barbecue going, they had music going, they had Fat Sam with me, you know, because I didn't used to take it in the pub. I don't think she was allowed in the in the premises, but she was obviously allowed in the garden. Uh, so we sat out there and we was having a drink and having some barbecued food, burgers and sausages and what have you. And at some stage in the proceedings, I can't remember exactly how it came about, um, but uh, Sue, this Scottish girl, um, decided that she was going to challenge me to some sort of a drinking competition. Um, now, I was done up like a kipper. I didn't realise at the time um, that when she was going to the bar, she wasn't actually actually getting any alcohol in hers, and if I was getting alcohol in hers, she was tipping it in the plant pot. Um, but I was bang up for it, and I was proper, proper on it all day. Uh, as was everyone else, but I think mine was a little bit more extreme. Now, I was fishing in this southwesterly swim that I told you about earlier at the time, uh, and as I explained, you've got these cables running across, and it's very, very hard to cast. So before I'd left, I'd got everything sorted out absolutely perfectly. Um, both rods were clipped up. I don't think we had clips on our spools back then. Oh, I've don't you? got one here, so I'll know. No, we didn't. I think what I used to do was cast out to the required distance, and whereas nowadays you'd put the line in a little clip in the side of the spool, I think I used to put elastic bands around it. Um, so you'd cast out, you know, and it'd hit the elastic band, and that would do 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 and you'd be on the right mark. But I do remember I had both rods set up perfectly, one for the this close bar on the right, one for the long bar on the left, or whatever. I'd baited them all up. I had I'd taken a note of the exact trees on the far bank I'd got a cast at. Um, nothing could go wrong really, it was all, all set up perfectly uh, until we went to the pub. So at some stage we must have left the pub. Um, we must have done because I'm not still there so I can't remember leaving the pub. Um, and at some stage we must have got back to the lake. I can't actually remember getting back to the lake. All I remember is laughter. A lot of laughter the next morning and it sounded an awful lot like Keith. Um, I've sort of opened my eyes, I'm in the, the bivvy somewhere, I've opened my eyes and everything's a bit bright and a bit of a blur, the laughter stopped, so I've just shut my eyes and gone back to sleep. About ten minutes later I heard the click of a camera and more laughter um, and I thought something's definitely going on here. Now I've tried to find this photo, I've got, I found Keith yesterday, um, he's tried to find the photo but we can't find the photo so I'll have to describe it to you. What he saw as he walked into my swim, my perfectly prepared swim, was first of all, he saw a rod hanging from the rod tip from one of these pylon cables, the butt about yay far off the floor, just gently swinging in the breeze. He saw my other rod in the bushes to the left in a great big tangle, and for some reason my plumbing rod um, was out and all tangled up as well and that was hung in a tree branch or something where I'd cast into what I was doing with the plumbing rod, I have no idea. Um, he l then looked in the bivvy and there was my perfectly made bed that hadn't been slept in at all and I was behind the bed, um, there was another bed chair there that the girlfriend was sleeping on, uh, which had collapsed, the legs had completely broken. Uh, and I was behind there on the floor. I don't think I had any clothes on at the time. There'd been none of that sort of stuff going on. Um, what it transpired had happened is when we got back from the pub, I decided to go skinny dipping in pit three. So I'd stripped off all my clothes, jumped into pit three, swum round in a few circles for a while, got out, then gone back to my swim, tried to cast my beautifully prepared setups through the wires of the overhead cables, obviously cast right round with the first one, 
round with the second one, I assume I then got the plumbing float out and tried to refine the bars before completely giving up, missing my bed, collapsing the one at the back and passing it out cold. Um, so yeah, that was quite a memorable August bank holiday session. Um, not a lot of fishing went on, uh, which is probably just as well really. Um, but that was pit four in the 80s for you. That was the Cone Valley in the 80s. I'm sure there were people all around the valley in a very, very similar state that night. But yeah, all good clean fun. So anyway, enough of the drinking stories. I've already, like I say, painted myself in a bad enough light as it is. Um, but like I said, that was then, different times. Um, fishing, that's what we're supposed to be talking about, isn't it? Carp fishing, uh, remember it well. So autumn soon rolled around um, and I found a new area that I really liked fishing and I saw quite a few fish in it and it was a swim called Car Park Swim. So you, on the first winter we fished there, we did well from sort of the Oaks, which is on the bottom bank near Pit 3. Um, and that goes along from, well, if you if you walk along from the Oaks for about 100 yards or so, you're in the car park, and then you go up the canal bank, and the very first swim on the canal bank, which actually backs onto the car park, you could back your van against sort of the little wicker fence on the side of the swim. It was a beautiful, beautiful little swim. And that fishes out to a similar area to the Oaks. Uh, there's a great big gravel feature out there. Um, I'd had a good feel about with the old ball heads and... Um, sort of sussed out exactly how it lay at the really sharp stony bit on, on the front. I think it dropped down quite quickly on the right and on the left hand side it was more of a slope coming off the sort of back and side of it with this lovely sort of sandy patch. That, that, you know, I, I have mentioned this before but the sand at the bottom of the bar um, is prime real estate. That's where you're going to get your bites. And such was the case in this swim. Um, really got it sorted but I couldn't ever get a bite on anything apart from this one rod. I think it was my left hand rod on this sandy patch. Um, but I think I had something like five fish in three weekends from there, three consecutive weekends, or sessions, you know, the weekends or midweeks or whatever. Um, which was good going for Pit 4, it really was. Uh, no monsters, you know, mid-20s. Um, I had a nice common from there as well. There weren't that many commons of, of a better stamp in Pit 4, but I did have sort of a I can't remember exactly how big, but a low mid-20 common from there, I remember that. Um, and a couple of corking mirrors, but I loved that little swim. It was a beautiful, beautiful little swim, like I say, all sculpted in and that. I've got some lovely photos sat in there. So the car park swim was also where the fateful buzzer incident occurred. Um, I wrote about it in my book. It was quite an amusing story for me anyway. Not everybody involved was quite so tickled pink by it to be honest. Um, what used to happen um, on a Wednesday or Thursday or whatever I'd go fishing. I'd do me a couple of three days or two and a half days of me artexing uh, and then as soon as I'd earned enough money boff, I was off. Um, I'd go around to Keith's house. I'd load my gear up and drive around to Keith's house load his gear up in the van and then I'd go up the lake. Uh, I'd get set up and fish for a couple of days and a pre-arranged time on a Friday, because Keith had a normal sort of, you know, Monday to Friday job, a uh, pre-arranged time on the Friday, because um, I think we were still pre-mobile phones then, so we had to, you know, get everything sorted prior. Um, I'd drive up to Denham Station, he'd make his way by train to Denham Station and I'd pick him up from there. Denham Station is just up the road, the other side of Savvy, not far. Uh, driving back to the lake, he'd get set up, fish the weekend, and we'd go home together on Sunday. That was the normal sort of setup, uh, and it was this particular week. So I'd got there, I was fishing, let's say, in this car park swim, got in there, started to get set up, uh, and somehow I'd left my buzzers at home. I must have taken them out to put new batteries in or whatever, dry them out, I don't know. Um, Anyway, I had no buzzers. I thought, oh God, this is a disaster. I thought, oh, I've got Keith's gear. Um, so I've gone through his rod bag and had a search through and wherever he stashed them, eventually I found his buzzers. And I thought, well, they'll do to start with until Friday when Keith turns up and then I'll just have to, I don't know, put the old coins on the spool with a saucepan underneath or something, whatever. So I fished to start with. Um, using Keith's buzzers, then picked him up on the Friday, he came down, I had to relinquish the buzzers. Uh, Mark was also there by then, told him, you know, the story, and he said, oh, I've got a spare, spare set of buzzers, you can borrow. Um, 
it wasn't quite as forthcoming as that because uh, I should explain a little bit about Mark's buzzers. Mark's buzzers, if he gets a run at pit four, you can hear it in, in Edinburgh, you know. He had these Delkin conversions and a couple of sets of, and he had them fine-tuned. Uh, you know what bite alarms are like, if you, if you twist the volume and the tone, there's always that one piercing tone that everybody else on the lake hates. Um, and he'd make sure every one of his buzzers was on that absolutely piercing tone, full volume, absolute full bore, highest tone, well not the highest, but the most annoying tone of the lot. Um, and oh, he just cherished these bite alarms. Um, but fair play to him, he, he, you know, he said he'd lend me his spare set, but it was under pain of death that I wasn't allowed to even look at the volume and the tone controls, let alone adjust them. I wasn't allowed to do anything to them whatsoever, just use them. So I was like, yeah, okay, fair enough. So anyway, I used these buzzers. Um, yeah, I was dreading getting a run on them because the noise would frighten me to death. I have mine as low as possible. Uh, but anyway, whether I caught on them or not is immaterial, totally. Um, so come the end of the session, um, Keith's packing up, I'm packing up loading all the stuff into the back of my van. It only used to just fit, you have to put it in a certain way. And I've come across and I've got Mark's buzzers and I've got them as a separate, uh, completely separate item. Like they're made of very, very fine porcelain. Um, carried them across, they didn't touch them on anything. And I've put them on the, the roof of the car, just next to the open sort of door. <coughs> to give back to him, he's fishing just around the corner. Anyway, we loaded up the motor. Uh, we got in the motor, shut the doors and drove off. Um, we got along the, the big bumpy lane down past pit three and pit two and pit one and out the gate up to Denham, swung a left, gone along the link road onto the motorway and we're off. You know, we're steaming down the M25 on the way home. Halfway down the M25, suddenly it sounded like something had hit the roof of my car, like a bird or something. Um, and I've heard bong, bong, dong, 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 dong across the roof. And I've looked in the, in the side mirror just long enough to see a black thing like fly off the top of my roof, hit the road and disappear under the traffic behind. He's gone, what on earth was that? I said, I don't know mate, it might be a bird or something. I said, it looked black and square and, oh shit, Mark's buzzers, Mark's little soldiers, Mark's pride and joy had somehow survived the bumpy lane, the Denham station run, the link road, and half the motorway sat on the roof of the car and then the wind must have got under them and smacked it. Well, I didn't even go back to look. They went straight under the traffic behind on the M25 central lane. Destroyed. I'm like, oh my God, Mark is going to go mental. I mean, proper mental. We're just like some shot ball alarms. He's at the old fashioned, when I say Delkims, not like Delkims you buy now off the shelf. Back in those days, you had Delkims alarms specially converted. Um, so someone had, had work on a, on a base alarm and put in GPO speakers and special wiring and, and that, you know, absolute works of art. And not just that, they were Mark's pride and joy and they were no longer. Um, so the next week <laughs> I had to go up there and explained to him, not only had I forgotten to give his alarms back, but he was never going to see them again. Uh, he wasn't best pleased. He really wasn't best pleased. I had to get him. I, I know uh, Steve Neville, um, and I knew him very well at that time. Uh, and I used to get Steve Neville alarms. I used to sell them for him. Um, so I had to go through a box of, of new Steve Neville alarms and try every one until I get, could get the three loudest ones, because they were all slightly different Steve Neville's on the pitch and I got the three loudest ones I could uh, and gave them to Mark as a some sort of compensation with lots of, oh, I'm so sorry, and probably some beer along the way. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, that was the end of his alarms. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh really, but uh, there you go anyway. And I do remember that was probably where I spent my last but one session on Pit 4. Like I said, I fished it through the oar, made a few fish, and it used to tail off quite quickly, you know, be before it even got really proper winter, Pit 4 did. Um, and I probably shot back to Tillgate, which was my local lake, and did a bit of fishing, you know, there. Um, but it was Christmas, um, and I was single again by now. Um, 
and my mum had invited me up. She had a pub in a place called Marshfield, which is between Bath and Bristol, that sort of area, West Country. Um, and she had a pub up there and she did invite me up for Christmas. And I remember I went up there um, a few days before Christmas. Uh, and within a couple of days before it even got to Christmas, I'd sort of had enough, you know, family, Christmas and all that. I weren't, you know, weren't really into it. Um, and I had my fishing gear with me, so I decided I was going to go to Pit 4 and I was going to fish Christmas Day on my own in splendid isolation. I'd had enough of the Christmas thing, you know. Um, yeah, I was single. I was... Um, uh, everybody else was out in their family groups and, and couples and what have you. And I thought, I don't really want anything to do with this with it this year. I'm going to go to Pit 4 and I'm just going to, I won't see a soul. And I'm going to set up and I'm going to take myself a bottle of port um, and a couple of steaks or whatever. And I'm going to fish Christmas Day, Christmas night, Boxing Day, Boxing night on my own at Pit 4. And that's exactly what I did. And I did no more than back up to this car park swim. And I set myself up, nice little bivvy set up, and I had one, as we said earlier, one of these little plastic portable TVs. Uh, and I think I rigged up, because it was quite cold, obviously, being Christmas, and I rigged up, uh, we used to use the, the uh, monkey climber needles then, like, like a stainless needle with your, your bobbin that went up and down on it. Um, and I'd got a spare one, and I'd put a bit of plasticine on the end, um, and stuck that on the volume and the channel, control so I could it was sticky so it was like a, a very early version of a remote control if you like so I could lay in bed I'd got the TV propped up at the end of the bed on a box and I could just stab the blue tack or whatever it was the, the sticky bit on the control and turn it up and down and, and retune it tuning not quite as easy as it sounds because it was literally one of them really old-fashioned ones where if you didn't get it quite right the picture used to just keep scrolling round and but anyway I'd managed to tune it in I'd uh, it was dark o'clock. Um, I probably finished off my bottle of port, um, and I decided to watch ET. Um, it was the first time I'd seen ET. Um, now, ET is one of them films, isn't it? It's a uh, it's a great film. It's sort of a kids' film, but there's a lot of it aimed at adults as well. But when you're on your own in a bivvy with a bottle of port inside you, it's quite emotional, isn't it? Um, the bit where you think E.T.'s died in that ditch thing. I must admit, I had a little bit of a pineapple in my throat <laughs> watching that. <laughs> but it was a very surreal uh, situation, really, being there, sat in a bivvy on Christmas Day on your own. Sad, really, isn't it? But there you go. It's what I wanted to do, so it's what I've done. Um, and that was sort of the end of Pit 4 for us. We did go back. We went back for the last weekend of the season. I think nearly everybody went back, like the, the group um, went back for that last weekend, um, yeah, just to give it a good see off. Um, but I know me and Keith dropped our tickets at the end of that year. And if I remember correctly, I think most of the Essex lads did as well. So that was a bit of an end of an era for us. Um, and I remember driving home from there and, and with Keith and we weren't really sure where we were going to go after that. Um, we'd heard about a couple of lakes, we'd, we'd applied for a couple of tickets, um, one of which we'd been accepted for, which was Frampton Court. Um, again, I don't know how many of you know of Frampton Court. It was quite well known in its day, Frampton Court. It had a big fish in there, it had a 40 pounder, I believe, in there. It, it did a 40 pounder, whether we knew about it at that time, I'm not sure, I can't remember, but definitely the, the next year it did a 40 pounder. But it had some good 30s in there, it had some better stamper fish in there, without a doubt. Uh, and that's right down in the West Country, a long way, long way over. Um, and we'd also applied for Horton. Um, now, Horton at the time uh, used to be a trout fishery, um, and the fish, that, the famous fish from Horton Fish, actually came from Longfield, which was another water run by the same company. Which has changed names a few times. It was RMC Leisure Sports. It, it was one of those two at the time. Um, it's now changed and changed again. Uh, anyway, we'd applied for this ticket for Horton. Um, now all we knew of Horton was we knew the fish. You know, we knew these were the long field fish. For some reason, they'd netted all the fish out. Some political decision that I'm not going into. I wasn't part of. I don't know a lot about. I had friends fishing. Um, Longfield at the time. I mean, Steve Alcott was on there, Bernie Loftus was on there. We knew a lot of the crew that were on there. 
um, something happened and the fish got taken out and they got put in Horton. And then they'd opened Horton for one year as um, a day ticket wooer, and that went down really badly. You know, you've got all of these historic fish, um, very hard to catch fish, very clued up fish, and then they've been put on a sort of a day ticket approach. Um, there was a lot of press, bad press, good press, whatever. There was a lot of controversy o over the whole thing. And at the end of that, this ran concurrent with, with my last season on Bit 4. And at the end of that year, they decided that it wasn't such a good decision after all, and they'd scrapped it. And they were starting a brand new syndicate on there, a uh, 50-man syndicate. And me and Keith had applied for tickets. We thought, that, that sounds like a bit of us. It's going to be you know, a better environment. It's going to be nicely run. Uh, and you've got these, you know, you've got fish like Jack the Net Ripper, 40 pounder, um, shoulders, you know, the lady, the koi, all these fish that you'd seen in, in books and magazines over the year, the parrot, um, there was lumpy from the road. Like, there was this amazing, amazing stock of fish in this lake. And we'd applied for tickets and we'd got, we were on the list uh, for a 50 man syndicate. I believe we were number 52 and 53. Um, but we wouldn't find out until the middle of the close season whether we'd got tickets or not. So as we drove home from Pit 4 that last day, last day after the end of the season, we were totally unsure where we'd be fishing, if we'd be fishing, how we'd be fishing. Um, I'd say we had Frampton, but I think in our heart of hearts we really wanted Horton, but we just had to wait and see. Um, we found out, but we'll do that next week, shall we? Well, I say next week, day after tomorrow. I'm tending to do this filming. I do a day's filming, a day's editing, a day's filming, a day's editing. There's a lot of scanning of old photos that's got to go in. And um, for Horton, which, like I say, will come up in the ne next episode, for Horton, I've actually got a lot of video, like on the bank video from you know, our time at Horton. Um, it's going to take a bit of splicing in, to be honest. I think I'm. I'm making it hard for myself, as from the next episode, um, but it would be criminal not to share it with you. Um, there was two, Phil Thompson and Sticky Bean had camcorders, and they got a lot of use throughout. The, we ended up being on there for three years, and through those three years, um, those camcorders got a lot of use, and at the end of it, we made uh, a cassette tape, a, what do you call it, a, DV, a VHS tape, clonking great thing, and we only probably only ma ever made about 20 copies. They were just for, for, not even for all the members, just just for a few, like you know the sort of nucleus of members that have been there from the start. Uh, not for any money. They were just done them as a thing. Uh, and me and Keith mixed the soundtrack over the top on this great big old-fashioned mixing desk thing that we'd managed to get hold of. Um, and then in recent years, Sticky Bean put some of them, he digitalised them, uh, and I've got them. Um, so I've actually got all this footage from back on the bank uh, in the days of Horton, which I'm going to try my hardest uh, to splice into the next few episodes. So you can actually, rather than just listening to me prattling on and trying to picture it, you can actually see what what we were then, what it was then, and how it all transpired. So that's the big plans I've got. So we'll see how that goes. But so I am going to go. Oh, actually, no. Here we've got my Berlin Wall photo. I'm going to stick that on the uh, the wall of shame behind me. It's Harry's dodgy, sticky stuff that we found. Um, and like I've said at the end of a couple of these, and I have had a good response. Where are we going to stick this? Up there, I think. If you do like the stories from this and you do want to hear more or read more because you're going to have to do the next two books yourself I am I've just heard on the radio by the way that they're probably extending the lockdown which we all expected so as I promised I am going to extend the offer, the lockdown special on fine lines and a flick of the tail I'm going to keep this going um, until we're back on the bank basically I'll be doing fine lines for 25 quid and flick of the tail for 15 quid off my website www.davelane.co.uk and like I say I'll keep that offer going until we're all back on the bank <sighs> I think we're done 
you know, I can replace the orange juice with a little bit of moonshine. So there we go. Until the next episode. Thank you very much for watching. Cheers.